I'm so glad to be here to get a chance to bring God's word to you today. And um, my husband sends his regrets. He was hoping to be here, but he is representing Anglican Frontier Mission in a, at a church in Fredericksburg. So that's, that's where he is, and um, my kids are worshiping in Leesburg. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and it's really not nice of Peter to give me the, my very first sermon with topics about divorce. And so, but the good thing Robert is, oh, he did. <laughs> well, there you go, carrying on the tradition. That's a good thing. But the good thing about the, the lectionary is that we also have Hebrews and the Psalms. So I'm going to be more <laughs> focusing on them. And, uh, and actually, I'm going to be looking at and talking about a very painful and difficult topic, and that is death. So even as I was working on this sermon on Thursday morning, I wondered to myself, when I, when I, what awful image is going to come up into people's minds when I talk about this topic, having no idea that on the very edge of our consciousness is the horror of these students' deaths, and then it might bring us to tears and put that lump in our throat. I didn't know. But we're talking about death because we need to. We talk about it at funerals, we talk about death at baptisms, and we even scare ourselves to death at Halloween, or at least our culture does. And I just want to say that I know that I'm speaking to a congregation where the grieving of loss is present for some of you. And my hope is that this is not going to make things worse. But if you stick with me until the end, you, you will hear a gospel of hope. But first, we're going to have to go through this gauntlet and to pass through that. So my first point, we live between the now and the not yet. Actually, backing up just a little, I do have my own experiences with death, and it's from this deep reflection that I offer these words. See, my parents were divorced when I was little, and my father remarried, and the woman that my stepmom really became mom to me. She was mom, and we were close. But that was shaken when she was about 40 years old when the doctors discovered breast cancer. I was 12. We spent the next several years with lots of hope that she would respond to treatment. But after about five years or so, all prospects were running out. Bone cancer had set in, and it was not planning to leave. <clears throat> now, my mother was, my stepmother was a feisty Christian faith-filled woman, and she was not afraid to talk about things. I mean, even when it came time to talk about the sex talk, she had no problem. She was that kind of woman. So what did she do when she was looking at this difficult thing, death? She talked about it every single day. I was a senior in high school. This is supposed to be the fun year. <laughs> it's supposed to be the highlight. And I had all these activities I was involved in. I was working at High's Ice Cream Parlor. I was flirting with the boys there. Um, still being very chaste, mind you. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. But I came home to a heavy, heavy home. My mom was looking at face in the uh, looking in the face at death, and so my biggest fear was to be the one who would find her by myself. Sometimes I would tiptoe past the door, sort of to pretend that I'm not really there, so that I didn't need to go in. And if I did go in, I always braced myself before entering that room. Without a doubt, I know that she prepared me for being a priest today. I spent a summer as a chaplain in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Hospital Center. It, this is a very big hospital with lots of trauma and death. So when it came time to sit with a woman who had passed, she was about 60, and she was a do not resuscitate, and she was in the middle of an MRI machine but the hospital could not do anything. And so while the other nurses and other people needed to do their jobs, 
and even sometimes walking past and poking in and saying, oh, no. I sat and I waited. I was giving her the dignity and the honor. It was important that she not be alone. I was waiting for her daughter to show up. See, one of the realities of being a priest is being in the room with death, with the dead, on purpose, with no option of turning away. So today I am grateful for my mother's life, her witness, and for her death because she's made me ready. So as we get back to our topic, I would encourage you to turn to, to Hebrews chapter 2 starting with verse 5. It's found on page 1001 in your pew Bible. See, what's, what's going on in the, in the first chapter of Hebrews is all about who Jesus is, the preeminence of him, as especially in relationship to the angels. And the writer we see quotes the very psalm that we, we read this morning. And Interestingly, it's not for lack of memory that it says, and somewhere in the Bible, because I kind of used to struggle with that. What do you mean? Why aren't you quoting exactly where? But there's an interesting thing. The writer is recognizing that it is scripture, that it was God who is speaking, okay? Not necessarily where it's found, as in the Psalms. And I found that to be really helpful, because I had always sort of struggled with that. <laughs> so today's Psalm is cited here because the author wanted to emphasize that Jesus has fulfilled the vocation intended for humankind. Do you know the psalm is talking about us? We are the humans who are made lower than the angels. We are crowned with glory. And we are given a purpose to have dominion over all creation, to steward, God, steward God's good creation. And actually, that's the part that fits back to our Genesis passage. That's, that's the purpose that God has for us. But we messed up, all of us. In verse 8, if, if you look at the second half of verse 8, we see, now, in putting everything in subjection to Jesus, he left nothing outside his control. We know from the testimony of Scripture, we can look at Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, or Colossians 1, 15 to 20, that at the ascension of Jesus, every single entity was put under the authority of Jesus the King. He is the one who conquered the greatest foe, which is death. But if we keep on reading, we see, quote, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Here it is, the now and the not yet. Sometimes, so now we're kind of coming to a clash of reality. That is our experience of life. Sometimes we experience life where God's sovereign control is not evident. It's, it's difficult to see. We wonder what's going on. We struggle. We say, this is unjust. This is not right. This is not the way it's supposed to be. So if we stop there, we're left with a conundrum. Which one is it? Have all things been subjected to the Son? Or does this universal dominion lie yet in the future? The answer is yes. <laughs> Both, yes. The Son's rule is already a reality. But if you notice in the scriptures, it says, see. We only see with eyes of faith that Jesus is the incarnate sufferer. Who, who has been crowned with glory, and we wait for the revealing for all to see. We have been given God's, God the Father's eyes. We have to ask for them, and then God gladly allows us to see what's really happening. Now, Jesus had a purpose for sharing our flesh and blood, as it says in verse 14. He is the faithful Israel. He's the faithful one where the people of God, like us, have failed. He didn't. Verse 9, it says, he was made a little lower than the angels for a time, and he was crowned with glory because of the suffering of death, so that he might taste death for everyone. So what does it matter that Jesus experiences death? So now we're going to be moving to my second point. We need a champion. Jesus 
is our champion. Now, perhaps this will make you think of a familiar Bible story. If, if the kids are here, I'm not going to put you kids on the spot, but <laughs> the story of David and Goliath. What would happen is that sometimes when enemy nations would clash with one another, instead of having their whole armies go against one another, they say, we'll pick our best guy. And that's what the Philistines did in 1 Samuel 17. They said, we've got Goliath. Yeah, let's send him in. So Israel, who are you going to send? little David, little guy David. So it, now if you've been in church for any length of time, you know the Sunday school lesson might end something like this. Be a David, right? Even if you're weak, even if you're feeling vulnerable, and you need to have the courage and you have the faith. And that's true. That is a true thing, okay? It is a good sentiment. But if that's all we get, we're missing the point. And that is, there is an enemy that is so great that no matter how, the number or, or value of the, our faith-filled Davids will ever be able to conquer. And that enemy, of course, is death. And when we face it, we will look around at one another and say, we need a champion. And that champion is not going to come from one of us. So the ESV in verse 10 says, translated it as the founder of our salvation. You could say founder as the trailblazer, the first one out. Okay? It's a very good translation. But there's another way of doing this, another way of thinking of this, and that is as champion and savior. The, the Greek word is archegos and soter meaning champion and savior. So did you know that the Greeks referred to Hercules as their archegos and their soter? Here is their strong man, and that's how they referred to him. See, but Hercules was this champion and this savior in a world that was really pretty bad off, and there was no one else who could say, solve the problem. It's kind of like us. There's no way that we're going to solve this problem. One day, whether we're ready for it or not, we will have to face death. And what waits for you on the other side is not something you can conquer. We will lose. We all lose. Now, this is like the American Ninja Warrior amped up to the nth degree. Because it's not a, testament, a test about how strong we are, because maybe you're strong, but when it comes to death, you're not going to win. It's not about how smart we are, how we can move critical thinking, problem solving, get around it. It's, the problem is too big. The issue is how perfect we are. Have our actions and our thoughts been perfect and pure from the cradle? I don't think so. We know that no human is actually able to pass through this competition and come out a winner on the other side. We all die in the end, so the only one who could possibly come out on the other, uh, on the other side as the winner is someone who is human and divine. See, Jesus, who in our psalm this morning reminds us, who sets the moon and the stars in their place, the one who was made a little lower than the angels, but even for a little time, he, it, it, while, for a little while he was made lower than the heavenly beings. This one is crowned with glory and who has dominion over all things and control of all things. This is Jesus, and he is our champion. So, re so for personally, rather than go into this fight, I pick him. Why face it alone? See, I want to recap now. We live in the time of the now and the not yet, where we need eyes of faith. We have a champion who, having run the gauntlet of death and actually won, okay, but where does that actually leave us? Where does that leave me? So that's where you ask the so what question. Good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Have you read verse 11? That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. 
Do you see the familial? Or going on in verse 13, Behold, I and the children God has given me. So get this. Of all the people who might be embarrassed by his family members would be Jesus. Except he's not. He's not trying to hide us away in the attic like a, lo a crazy aunt or, or just a strange relative that you don't really want to talk about. No. Jesus says, you are my family. We have to ask the question, am I ashamed to call him family back? See, Jesus says, I want you to have my last name. We are Jesus people. His decision to take solidarity with humanity was for a purpose. See, our champion is not an alien like the doctor of, of BBC's Doctor Who. He's not a mythical human like Hercules. He's not a Marvel hero. As we live in the middle of the now and the not yet, we recognize we can only hang on to hope if we know that we have come to the end of our own resources. Death looks at us, but we say, I'm not going to meet you alone. I'm going to meet you with my brother Jesus, with the one who knows where I go wrong, but who says, that's okay. I have already conquered death. I love them. I already know, Jesus also continues, I already know that death is defeated, and I know how to defeat it again. For you, my beloved sister, for you, my beloved brother, Jesus says, you come with me. Amen.